Aloha Kako. Welcome to the show Policy for the People. I'm your host, Minara Mordecai. The show is dedicated to unveiling pressing issues that are facing Hawaii today, and attempting to identify policies that will provide effective solutions. Today on the show, we are discussing the growing aging population in Hawaii and its impact on the nursing profession. My guests are Ina Chang, who has practiced as a nurse in Honolulu for over a decade, and Sam Fulmer, a nursing student at UH Manoa. Welcome, Sam and Ina. Um, let's begin with you, Ina. I know that you've been in geriatric care for almost um, the entire time you've been a nurse. Could you tell us about your work and what type of care do you provide right now? Currently, I am a hospice nurse, so I provide nursing care to most of my patients who are at home, allowing them the comfort to be at home and uh, treating them to be comfortable at home pretty much. So, and that's uh, previously I was working in long-term care, skilled nursing, um, slightly different, but still taking care of our kupuna, uh, kupuna and um, their aging needs and just uh, their health care. So yeah, so that was really nice. Thank you. So tell me, how does working with kupuna and specifically geriatric care, how does it differ for nurses um, from that? Does it require special training? Um, we don't really have like a special, like say like for labor and delivery or paid out. They don't really have, I would say um, in general, it is very different than um, what nurses would want, would think of doing like say in a hospital or an ER. We have to think about um, a lot of um, issues that are surrounding the patient. So beginning with their health, of course, um, they have a lot of comorbidities, meaning they have a lot of other illnesses that surround them. It's not only one issue. Some people go to the ER for one issue, uh, like they hurt their head and they need staples. Mm -hmm. And that's something pretty, you know, kind of textbook standard. Okay, stitch you up, go home. This one you might have like people have diabetes and then like COPD or some heart failure all together. And it's, um, you know, you have to manage the care with all their issues uh, physically. Um, and also they could have psychosocial issues. A lot of times they have Alzheimer's, dementia. And there's another interesting aspect that I don't feel like they really tell you in nursing school is the family, <laughs> uh, their support systems. So they also have the support systems that you have to help support and guide because in the end, they're gonna be the ones who take care of them. And then it all is kind of, that's pretty much all encompassing. And um, it's a lot just talking about it in action. It's yeah. even more, <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's a really rewarding. Um, it's a very rewarding um, a scope of nursing, I think. And it really teaches, it really teaches a caregiver how to um, like really think of health and healthcare in a different perspective, in my opinion, as a nurse, I think, every new nurse should be a geriatric nurse at least once, <laughs> <laughs> even if they don't really want to be one. <laughs> You'll probably end up actually, being one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that actually is a, a good transition to my next question is, do you think there are enough nurses in Hawaii who are trained to provide geriatric care or who are working in geriatric care? You know, so again, like I left nursing school for a while. When I first started nursing school, I didn't know anyone I really wanted to be a geriatric nurse in my school. And there was a class of, I think about 80, all of them just were set to go somewhere. None of them were geriatric. <laughs> mm -hmm. So no, I don't think there's enough emphasis on it. The need and the benefits and also the training. Um, I think it should be highlighted more and uh, not only in Hawaii, but all over probably. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like we don't have enough nurses in general. I feel like that are locally um, working. I think I think a lot of our nurses are transported here mm -hmm. um, for many reasons. But um, yeah. I think that we have enough nurses who work in the geriatric that just couldn't maybe find their dream job, whatnot, and then um, you know they stay for a while until they it. Basically, geriatric nursing is mostly a stepping stone for a lot of nurses. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So would you say um, the salaries and the benefits for geriatric care for nurses is comparable to other fields? Um, so I have always been a geriatric nurse. <laughs> so <laughs> as far as benefits, I'm pretty sure it's really just based on what company you go with. Mm -hmm. As far as salary, I've always known that we get paid significantly less than the mainland mm -hmm. <laughs> to nurses. And that significance could be like $20 less an hour, which is very significant. Wow. And wow. I'm not talking about just my profession. Um, I'm talking about like in like every scope of nursing, <laughs> like 10 to like 20. I can, I noticed that like when I, I was curious to look up stats before and I was like, think about like half a year when I was like, wow, we're still there. And actually I think consistently Hawaii had been voted to be one of the worst states to work as a nurse before. <laughs> like when I saw it hardest, not worse, but hard to work because it's just a lot less pay than, mm -hmm. I mean, so for a you nurse, if you're not nurses, attached. Do you see a lot of nurses leaving for the mainland because of that? I do have a lot of nurses in my class that have left. Um, a lot of them, but they're not necessarily nursing reasons. They're more likely like finance, like kind of financial reasons, which I guess kind of ties with their nursing because that's their career. But yeah. there's just more opportunities out there in some ways. And they, again, they strive for different things. So if they want to be in like a burn unit, you know, we don't have really burn units yeah. here. If they have a special they want to pursue, they need to go in the mainland. So. So how do the facilities are dealing with the shortage of nurses, specifically in geriatric care? Um, are they recruiting from other places? Or what do you see happening, if anything? Or are you just overworked? Um, I think all nurses are overworked in general, not only for geriatric, just an opinion of mine. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, from past, I know that we have contacted agency nurses a lot. We either, but we don't always like to contact agency nurses because I think it's an unsterly amount of money that is just um, hurt the, the company a lot to try to hire a, a nurse from outside the company come in. They would rather have their on calls pick it up or yeah, like someone wants to do an extra shift or, you know, uh, more money because it's going to be overtime, then they'll probably do that. Or worse mm -hmm. comes it is you just kind of end up finding people covering half shifts to half shifts or, you know, just um, yeah. maybe just, just kind of like that, just pull together somehow. But it's never something that's nicely planned in my screen. And you say that um, you've, at least around you, you see nurses being overworked. What does that look like? Is it too many hours, too many patients? Um, uh, tell me, describe it, you know, day to day, how do you feel like you could have, you could have more support or resources to help you do your job well? Um, I think the nature of geriatric nursing is that it is not very predictable and acute things can emerge and acute incidents kind of emerge. Therefore, it makes it hard to plan out your day. A typical nurse in geriatrics will have about 16 to 18 patients. Um, so that's skilled and long-term mix. So if, if, a, if a nothing happens, that's great. If everything happens, then, you know, then you get, get really burnt out. You have to mm -hmm. stay longer. In a facility, it just means that you would just spend more time at the end of your shift following up on the care. Mm -hmm. Because you always have that next shift to come and support you to you know, go on the floor, but you still have to finish what you, you know, happen during your shift. For me as a hospice nurse, that just means I would spend a lot of time, you know, uh, adjunctly like documenting and helping with care. I have gone over time at a patient's house before very long, just to the situation. And it just means that you just have to have a longer day. Um, you are just very, compounded with um, a lot of documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, no one really mentioned that in nursing school for me. <laughs> Maybe if they did, it would have changed my life a little bit. <laughs> but um, a good amount a of your, 
yeah. the amount of your days spent doing paper charting and paperwork. Yeah, and I believe that's because that's how we get reimbursed in this system is we have to be very careful and we have to uh, be very mindful of how we document and we still have to do the patient care, which a lot yeah. of times I feel the patient care takes, you know, it should take forth. Um, but when you have the pressure of your own life too, I haven't even started talking about people, nurses having a life, but we yeah. do. And then <laughs> having to document a days of work and happenings and uh, having to balance just taking care of your patient, it, it becomes a lot. It becomes, you know, you somehow you're, it becomes a marathon every day, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Sam, let's transition to you. Um, I know you've done some work with the elderly as well. Tell us about your experience caring for Kupuna in Hawaii. Yeah, so I, before I started my nursing program, I was working as a certified nursing assistant um, in a skilled nursing facility. So that's not, uh, it's not an acute hospital, but like a uh, subacute is what they would call that. So I would take care around like eight patients a day. Uh, mm -hmm. Majority of them were geriatric. Um, and I would be assisting nurses like Ina, um, helping her with her care. And she's, the nurses are basically like a CNA, they're like our boss. And so we're kind of their extension for the patients. So we're mm -hmm. helping them with their, yeah, what we call like active daily living skills, bathing, um, getting ready for therapy, uh, helping them throughout their day, whatever those needs may be. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's a really hands-on job. It's rewarding. It's very difficult. It's not easy work. A uh, very physically demanding job, but it's immensely rewarding. I think that's the draw to nursing is that you get such an award from the work that you're doing, such meaning mm -hmm. instantly. So yeah, it's definitely I think one of my goals to pursue uh, and advance myself in a nursing degree too. So. Mm. So when you were doing that kind of work, did you see? Um, did you find that there was a, a, a short or um, the nurses were overworked or there's a shortage of nurses? What was your experience uh, looking at as an assistant? Um, I think for me, it, it depends on kind of how, you know, saying different days you might have where or we talk about like acuity where mm -hmm. they might have some something might progress and it might need a little bit more attention. And so you can't go and reach another patient that might need your demands. You know, you mm -hmm. have your patients asking for your help simultaneously at the same time. And so that can kind of get difficult to manage. Mm. Uh, safety wise, you know, in nursing, we're always about quality, effective care, safety, like those are really harmful uh, mm -hmm. hallmark principles that we try to guide whatever action that we're doing. Um, I think, I think this narrative about nursing shortages, I think it, it's kind of it's kind of hard because I know a lot of when I'm looking at the job market right now as a prospective uh, nursing graduate, I'll be graduating this August and I get a sit for my NCLEX this fall. A lot of the jobs that are being offered are you need a couple years of experience under your belt before you can even apply. So there's kind of this gap between once I got my degree, now where can I get training on hand? Like at the hospital in the clinic setting to make myself more competent. So I think that's where there's some issues in, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, in that transition from nursing education to being a nurse. Okay, so it, it hasn't, the transition hasn't been streamlined at least. Um, so this actually, what I'm hearing is that um, the training or the type of care that you should, you're going to provide to geriatric um, patients, it does require some specialization. As Ina mentioned, um, there are multiple issues that can come up. Um, Ina said in her class, there wasn't a lot of specialized care, um, training. Um, so this was over 10 years ago. You're a nursing student now at UH Manoa. Do you see that there's increased focus on um, providing specialized training in geriatric care in the nursing program? I, I would say yes. Uh, we got to participate in this really cool program this spring semester. It was called the um, Geriatric Interprofessional Panel. 
And we actually mm -hmm. got a case study and we met with students from the medical school, um, pharmacy students, um, students in dietetics. We all got together and we uh, got to collaborate together because a lot of nursing care is in uh, interprofessional. So you're working with PT and OT, physical therapy, occupational therapists, dietitians, mm -hmm. medical doctors, nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, all of these different professionals that have certain skill sets and then we have to like synthesize together and create effective care plans for Kapuna. And then we kind of had that opportunity to work it out as students. And that was great because I kind of got to see different expertise, like um, listening to a social worker talk about at home care programs, you know, coordinating those things that me as a nurse, I, I don't have a lot of training in that, but that's her expertise, you know? So I think overall the dealing with you know, our, our aging population is that we have to be coming together and then strategizing together because we all have different points of view and expertise to deliver mm -hmm. like effective care to them. Um, are you learning about the increase in the or growing aging population in Hawaii as well and what type of demands there will be coming forward in the next two decades or so? Um, I'm not, I didn't learn mm, Forecasting for that population, yet yeah, we talk about it in class, but it's not specific per se. It's more because you have to like learn the theory of nursing and then we kind of discuss um, aspects of different uh, disease processes and how those will present in different populations. So we always are talking about like, okay, what is a geriatric patient different, you know, versus a pediatric patient with heart disease? Those are two different uh, patients, right? Or then you have a patient with hypertension and is pregnant as well. So how do you deal with that patient? Each one of those are going to be dealing with something different, even though the disease may be the same. Uh, looking, and we also understand too, most of my courses that I've been taking, I've been fortunate that a lot of our professors will always highlight, you know, okay, geriatric population, when you're dealing with them, here's some unique features that you have to uh, kind of take into consideration. And then kind of deal with those uh, dignity aspects, like trying to empower them to make correct choices. Kind of those uh, challenges of geriatric populations when they get a hip replacement or something, and then it starts limiting their mobility psychologically. How tough is that? You know, and then mm -hmm. trying to be compassionate and understanding how people, you know, it's hard to experience not like an illness, you know, psychologically mm -hmm. it's hard. And then how do you be compassionate as nurse providers? Um, and I think when nurses are stressed and they're not feeling like they're being supported by their employers or the institutions that they are working for, we can see that correlates with like not as effective of care that is being provided. Mm -hmm. And so then it's kind of talking about, okay, how can we make this, uh, how do we improve this? You know, mm -hmm. as, can we do it at the state level? Can we do it at, you know, or can we create incentives within the state for employers to employ more nurses or to mm -hmm. to allow them to do it as like a tax benefit or something. I mean, there's we have to start coming up with more creative ways instead of just letting it build up because it is going to become more and more of an issue. You know, mm -hmm. like they talk about the nursing age, I think right now is 49. A few years ago, the average age was 54. So it is going down for a nurse, but that's a high mm -hmm. age. So in the next 20 years, a large percentage of the nursing staff is going to retire. It'll be interesting what next year, because of COVID, how many nurses were still working, got maxed mm -hmm. out from that COVID dealing with the pandemic, you know, that stress, and then being like, okay, I'm done. I'm gonna, I can retire now. So I, it will be an interesting adjustment, I think in this upcoming year mm -hmm. is what will determine what, where our outlook will be going in the nursing field. So do you feel like, um, one, there's definitely a need to maintain the type of data and kind of evidence to help us plan ahead, right? Like seeing how many nurses are retiring in any given year and how do we fill that? Do you feel like in the nursing profession, this is a question for both of you, that the data that we're keeping to, um, to make sure that we are not finding yourself, ourselves in a critical shortage, is it sufficient? Do you feel like the state is... Is, is up to date in maintaining good numbers, good statistics and what the nursing profession looks like in Hawaii. Either one. Yeah, sure. Um, 
I, I mean, I, I, I've been using this a lot this whole year. It's like, it's, we just been through a pandemic. <laughs> so <laughs> I really feel like, no, not because of, you know, that we don't care, but it's just, we, we have gone through a lot this year. And I think it's a good, and it's you know, not to be over optimistic, but it's, it called attention to a lot of things that needed to be called upon. So my hope is, um, as Sam said, like in the future, we do, like from here on, then we do think of that. We do think of considering more of the statistics of what we need for a component. Because I think there was, I believe at least here, I feel that they do realize our geriatrics are the ones that were hit the hardest here. And mm -hmm. the, the care that was needed to coordinate um, definitely uh, needed some fine tuning, I think, probably. So it, I think it, it's good to be um, mindful, but I, I wouldn't, I don't think we have um, that much of a focus on statistics right now. I think everything is very COVID geared, very yeah. prevention geared, um, very population um, kind of a pandemic view geared. So in essence, mm -hmm. it could, I think it just takes the right person to like introduce it and then like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. We'll do that too. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm hopeful about that. So, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Sam, do you yeah. have any comments? On yeah, I think, um, for the like specifically, if we're talking about the state of Hawaii and different um, states and their departments of health, I think overall they do have a pulse on it. Um, you know, I think a lot of the time when we think about shortcomings or shortfalls within the healthcare system, we, we kind of pinpoint it onto people or maybe even a profession. You know, at the other time, it's it's a function of the system itself. So mm -hmm. when errors or shortfallings happens, it's the system that is at fault. So meaning structurally how we built it up to allow certain events to happen or to not happen. So structurally, what is unique to Hawaii? We have a really high cost of living. Mm. You know, land space is super limited. Do we have wow. enough housing facilities for Kapuna to go into? Do we have enough long-term care facilities for them to go into? Do people have to retire and go to the mainland? You know, do they have to leave their home? You know, you know, native wines are being pushed out of their homelands here. They're not able to survive in this very expensive state and it's going to become even more expensive. It's not going down. So can the state come together with other healthcare institutions, major hospitals and healthcare teams work together to try to resolve that? You know, those are some of the more interesting aspects of care that we need to consider. You know, and then it's going to be start pushing for the cheaper, you know, right now it's kind of like the race to the bottom, where's the cheapest labor is going to be, you know, the nursing profession yeah. makes up 90% of healthcare, you know, we're the foundation of healthcare at the end of the day, yeah. the nursing profession is yeah. that. So how are we empowering our local community and nursing profession to meet the need of our kapuna? You know? Great question. I'm going to bounce that right back to you. Like you have the experience, you are a student, you're, you, both, you experience both the educational aspect of it and the profession itself. Let's say you are at the decision makers table. What policies would you put into place or would you recommend to encourage more people to join the nursing profession and to enable them to be successful in their job? So how do you create that culture? Let's start with you, Sam. Okay, I have a few ideas. Okay, so Go ahead. in 20, 2019, <laughs> no, I looked this up. So in 2019, there was 624 nursing degrees awarded in the state of Hawaii in one year. That's a huge population. There's not 624 job openings in the last year. I don't think so. Could like, be wrong. What? <laughs> right? So can we incentivize like what if they didn't get tax or tax exemption program for training new grad nurses at your facility you know give them that 12 month program hands on uh kind of like your preceptorship you get in your last year of your nursing program they continued on with that to get you really get you on the ground running and then mm -hmm. to incentivize businesses and healthcare institutions to employ them to become part of their staff you know, and if it's not there, then somewhere else. So, or it can be like loan forgiveness programs that the state can start implementing. You know, there are available at the federal level, but we are, we're considered rural medicine. We can tap yeah. into resources here that bridges those gaps. And then mm -hmm. our institutions, like 
you know, New H Manoa, you have an entire faculty staff that are trained professionals in the nursing teaching discipline, right? How can they be employed by the long-term care facilities that need nursing? They need nurse staff. So how can they join together and build a program? I think for me, that's what I would love to see is them teaming up together, creating these programs for the new grads that are coming out where local individuals are graduating with nursing degrees and we don't know the exact next step. There's only so many new grad mm -hmm. programs available to us right now. And I would be to expand that in every type of nursing mm -hmm. career. Great. This is this is exactly why I have the show is so we can hear about policy recommendations from people who are on the ground. So um, Ina and I, you and I have had conversations about empowering families to care for their kupuna. Tell me more about that. I want to hear um, your ideas on how we can do that and being innovative in, in that kind of care. Yeah, so I, I really like them. I agree with that 100%, by the way. I also feel that there is need of more people to be more programs to involve family caregivers to be a part of, and not just when things happen, <laughs> just throughout, just I wish like, you know, their family, like hospitals or, or you know, uh, public health would just be like hold events like, hey, you know, like this is how you take the blood pressure, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, like and this yeah. is when you not that you need to know everything, but just know enough to feel confident to know when it is to contact the healthcare profession mm -hmm. and when it is to not run to the ER or, you know, just and they, they'll feel supported and in turn their patients, which is their loved ones my patients, um, will feel that as well. I also feel that they, um, because I'm a mother, I think they need to give just a little bit of support to, <laughs> to families, nurses who have families, because I feel like that's mm -hmm. where nurses feel the burnout. When, mm -hmm. you know, it's rewarding and we love it. We wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't be working if we didn't. But the truth is we also have, you know, a family and I, don't see that a lot. I, I really would like to see companies come on. That's not only a nursing profession thing. I know it's an all over America mm -hmm. kind of needs to <laughs> think about, uh, you know, kind of like mother kind of maternity leave kind of a thing. Or yeah. if they just need, I think that's a good incentive to have for keeping nurses, you know, engaged. Education, mm -hmm. nurses, I've known a lot of nurses who are CNAs, which are um, my helpers, as Sam said, rise up because they had the support and saw enough encouraging nurses around them to become mm -hmm. a nurse themselves, vice versa. Nurses mm -hmm. become nurse practitioners. I've trained a lot of nurses become nurse practitioners right now. So it's very, it, it's just, a, it, it can be very thriving, but it really I, needs yeah. to grow and support, so. I love it. Thank you so much for both of your ideas. This has been a great conversation. I'm so happy we got to do this. Thank you. I hope somebody takes to heart all the suggestions that you've made because you are on the ground doing this important work. Thank you and aloha. Take care. Thank you, Manara. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.